Welcome to Central Presbyterian Church. We're very glad that you've chosen to be with us this morning. We have a few announcements before we get started. Our outdoor morning worship services started this morning. We will continue them every Sunday morning, weather permitting, at 8.30 on the lawn in front of the chapel. We hope to see you there. We're excited to announce that though we cannot have a vacation Bible school on campus this year, we're going to offer a virtual vacation Bible school for the children of Central Presbyterian. Children ages three through rising fifth graders are invited to participate August 3rd through 5th virtually with us. Mark your calendars for a fun family fun night on August 6th. A registration link has been sent to your email and will also be available on the central homepage of, of our website. Next Sunday, we have a very special Sunday planned. We'll have our Youth Sunday. Now, our Youth Sunday was supposed to be in April, but, well, you know what happened. So next Sunday morning, our graduated seniors will each share a message with us. So please plan to tune in next Sunday morning for that special service. There is a new su summer Sunday school series that is available online. It's our uh, Minor Prophet series. So check that out on YouTube. And finally, there will be a congregational meeting today after this service at noon. This meeting will be on Zoom. You should have gotten a link via email on Friday and again this morning, so check your email for those links. Also, the Zoom meeting code will be here on the screen along with the password if you choose to use Zoom using the code and password. So let us worship God. Please join me for the call to worship, which is paired this morning with hymn number 612, We Praise You, O God. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our rock, our fortress, and our deliverer. Let us remember his mercy, for he is gracious and compassionate. We thank you for calling us to faith in Christ for putting your spirit within us, for giving us the mind of Christ, for gathering us together as your church.
Lord, for extending your grace to us, for calling us to a life of gratitude, for calling us to service in your kingdom. Thanks be to God. Let us give thanks to the Lord, for he satisfies the thirsty. He fills the hungry with good things, and he heals the afflicted. God, we see your hand at work in all the movement of the earth. We thank you for your ever-present provision. Thank you, gracious Father, that you provide for all our needs, for the food on our tables, for the clothing on our bodies, for the beds we sleep in, and for the dwellings that shelter us. We praise you for all your gifts that go beyond our basic needs, for the things that make our work easier, for the conveniences of modern life, for the beauty and pleasure that you bring into our lives. Thanks be to God. God's mercy is deeper than the depths of the sea, and God's grace is wider than the whole of the earth. Trusting in that mercy and that grace, let us make our confession before God and each other. Let us pray. Holy God, we open our hearts to you this day and offer the truth of our lives. The fear that stifles us, the prejudice that blinds us, the ignorance that hobbles us, the doubt that plagues us. Help us, we pray, that we will find courage in unlikely places, see the world with new and gracious eyes, move to those places where love is needed, have faith that you are with us. Amen. Hear the good news. We are forgiven. We are set free to go out into the world and be the loving, gracious, hopeful people of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God, who is able to do far beyond all that we could ask or imagine by his power at work within us. Ephesians 3.20 was our memory verse last year as we blasted off on a mission to Mars with God. Last year's VBS was a great reminder that with God's power, we can go beyond and do things that we never thought possible for his glory. In today's story, we talk all about going beyond with kindness and take a look at a story we heard Dr. Bailey preach on last Sunday. It is the story of the Good Samaritan. Let me illustrate for you how this story plays out. A man was traveling down a scary and rocky road by himself. Along came a group of men and they hurt him and took all of his money. They left the man alone on the side of the road. 
he was in pain and could not get up. A while later, a priest came walking by, but he did not stop to help. He actually went to the other side of the road and ignored the man who was hurt. Then later, another man passed by, but he too did not stop to help. Finally, a third man came by. Now it is important to note that this man was different from the other two. He was a Samaritan. But despite his differences, he stopped to help the man that he saw hurt and in need. Jesus calls us to be like the Samaritan boys and girls. Despite how others may look, how they might treat us, or what they might believe in, Jesus calls us to love them. Mark 12, verse 30 says, Love the Lord your God with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than this. In today's Kid Spot, we dive in to take a look at this story. We talk more about what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. And I give you a challenge to do something for someone else in need in our community. I hope you will join us. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for people who are different from us. Help us to love and serve them more. In your name I pray, amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Blessed are you, God of all creation, you spoke in the beginning, and all things came to be. You spoke, and your word came to live with us, full of grace and truth. Bless this place where we would hear your voice. As we listen, may our ears be attuned to you. As the word is spoken, may you speak to us. May all we hear lead us to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is taken from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. i 
The epistle reading today comes from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning I'd like to focus on a very basic part of Christian faith, which is extremely important but is also very difficult when you're going through tumultuous times. That is that people of faith are called to always be thankful. That requires more conscious attention and effort at some times in our lives than others, and now is certainly one of those times. The story is told about an extended family which gathered for Thanksgiving dinner every year, and the patriarch of the family was renowned for always offering a long, detailed prayer before the meal, listing all of the blessings that he was thankful for. One year as the family was gathering, there was a tremendous storm in process with thunder and lightning and torrential rain and heavy winds. And one of the little boys in the family said to his cousin, I wonder what he'll find to be thankful about today. When the time came to pray, the man said, Oh Lord, we thank you that it's not always like this. There's humor there, but it's also a very astute and wise prayer. Whenever we're going through a difficult period in our lives, we can and should look back over the whole of our lives and remember that things are not always like that. 
In fact, truth be told, for most of us, things have been good much more than they've been bad in our lives. And our experience, when we look back over them, shows us that when we pass through the valleys of life, eventually they will come to an end. So even as we pass through this time of global pandemic and bitter political strife about how seriously to take it, and economic distress and racial unrest and those election year commercials, we should take time regularly to count our many blessings, to count them one by one. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that we can be happy and thankful all the time in our lives. Our minds and bodies are subject to mood changes as we, and we react to crisis situations in our lives with panic with fear, even with depression, and that's okay. That's normal for human beings. So what's important for people of faith is to school ourselves to settle down after the shock of crisis passes to remember that God, who is good, is in charge and is going to walk with us through the crisis. So thankfulness is a spiritual discipline. It's not something that's just a natural reaction for us. I want to begin a journey through thankfulness in the Bible with Psalm 100, that beloved psalm of thanksgiving. It's one of those passages that's so familiar to us that we often just zip right through it without even really thinking about it, without paying attention to the theology it contains. There are four stanzas to this hymn, so we'll look briefly at each one of them. First one says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. The context of the Psalms, of course, is the religious life of ancient Israel. A temple was built in the time of Solomon. People who lived in and around Jerusalem could visit that temple regularly, but for many of the people of Israel, a visit to the temple was a very special occasion, maybe even just once a year at a festival time. A lot of the Psalms, which was Israel's hymn book, were used as psalms to sing on the way to the temple, psalms of ascent, joyful songs about making a pilgrimage to the temple and arriving there. A couple of notes about this first verse. First, the psalmist does not say, make perfectly pitched four-part harmony to the Lord. He says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. It's an act for everyone to be involved in, not just professional musicians. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, I pity everyone who dies with all their music still in them. People who never let the music out with singing or playing an instrument, but kept it all cooped up inside. One of the really sad aspects of the coronavirus is the warning about how deadly singing can be if you have it. That strips the church of its heartbeat when you can't sing. At least with the streaming services, we can sing along even if we are apart. And of course, to come into his presence does not require coming to a building any more than it did for the Israelites to have to come every week to a temple. Whenever we make time in our lives to read scripture, to pray, to meditate on God's blessings, to listen to or sing or play uplifting music of the faith, anytime we do any of those things, we are bringing ourselves into God's presence. We're opening ourselves to God's presence in our lives. And how are we to worship? Not grudgingly as people who are having to do that, but with gladness. Verse 2 says, Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. This is the heart of Israelite monotheism, the belief that there is one God alone who made us as our creator and whom we worship and serve. We belong to this God. We are his sheep and he is our shepherd. 
Our loyalties are not at all divided. And all people are in the sheep category. Only God is the shepherd to be listened to and followed. Verse 3 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. When a pilgrim would arrive in Jerusalem, he or she would find two large buildings standing side by side, the temple and the palace of the king. So we're reminded in this verse that our ultimate allegiance lies through the gates that lead to God's house not the gates that lead to the king's house. Enter these gates with praise, thanksgiving, and blessing. Why? Verse 4 says, because the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. Our reason for being always thankful is that God is good. Things may be happening in the world and in our lives that are not good, but God is good. And there's no end to his steadfast love for us that will last forever. He won't one day change his mind and decide he doesn't like us so much after all and he doesn't want to be our God anymore. His faithfulness will endure, not just through our lives, but through all generations. God keeps all of his promises. He always will. Great is thy faithfulness. There is no shadow of turning with thee. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. There are lots of examples in the Bible of people going through crises who courageously maintain their faith and are thankful for their God. In the book of Daniel, the king of Babylon sets up a 100-foot-high golden statue and issues a decree that everyone has to fall down and worship the statue whenever the trumpets blow. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not comply because it went against their belief in the one God of Israel. Well, the king threatened to throw them into a fiery furnace, but they told him not to waste his breath that their faith would not be deterred, that if God chose to deliver them from the furnace, <clears throat> that was well and good. But even if God did not choose <coughs> to deliver them, they still would worship only God and serve him alone. Another king signed a decree that no one could worship or pray to anyone but himself, the king, for 30 days. Well, Daniel continued to get on his knees and pray to God three times a day anyway. He was turned in by people who were out to get him and wanted to bring him down. And the king was greatly distressed about this because he loved Daniel. He tried all afternoon to find a way to save Daniel from being thrown into the lion's den, but he could find no way to undo the de decree that he himself had issued. How ironic. The king himself knew that salvation for Daniel could only come from one place. So as Daniel was thrown to the lions, the king said, May your God, whom you faithfully serve, save you. And the king fasted all night on Daniel's behalf. In the morning he found that God had indeed preserved Daniel's life. In the story about Job... Job starts out having everything anybody could want, and Satan takes it all away from him. At the beginning of the story, Job maintained his faith in spite of all that. And one day his wife said, Job, why don't you just go ahead and curse God, get it over with, and die? But Job said, are we going to accept the good that comes from the hand of God but not be willing to accept the bad things that happened to us? Of course, that wasn't the end of the story, and Job went through a very deep existential crisis of questioning God's goodness. But in the end, he was reminded that the Lord alone is God, and he was but a sheep of his pasture, 
And Job was reassured and was content. The prophet Jeremiah, whose warnings went totally unheeded by the king and the people of Judah, watched the army of Babylon advancing on Jerusalem at a time when others were panicking and giving up on the goodness of God. They felt like he deserted them. Jeremiah maintained his faith based on the long view. A relative came to him and offered him the opportunity to buy a piece of family land, which not so coincidentally, the Babylonians were marching over and occupying. But Jeremiah agreed to do it. He did it very publicly. He went through filing all the appropriate legal papers, making sure that they were put somewhere they would be safe and survive. Why? Because, he said, houses will again be bought and sold in this place. God was not through. This was not the last word. When Jesus was on trial before Pontius Pilate, the representative of Caesar... Pilate asked him, Do you not know that I have power to release you and I also have power to crucify you? Jesus replied, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Pilate seemed to realize the truth of this, unlike most political leaders, and tried to release them. But the crowd put the fear of Caesar in Pilate by chanting, If you release this man, you are no friend to the emperor. I guess Pilate decided the consequences would be worse with Caesar than with God. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, before his arrest, Jesus prayed to God, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. He didn't want to endure the suffering that he knew lay ahead for him. But he trusted the one he had always known to be good and faithful and loving in his life. Our last example is the Apostle Paul, who went through so much suffering in his missionary journeys. To the church in Rome, he wrote, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Later in the same letter, he wrote, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who will bring any charge against us? Who will condemn us? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? I'm convinced, he said, that neither death nor life, angels, rulers, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And from Philippians, a letter written from prison in Rome, we find an astonishing amount of joy and gratitude from one whose life would soon be brought to an end by earthly powers. Paul knew that his times were in God's hands, and he was okay with that. He trusted God to be at work for good both in his life and in his death when it came. And he knew his friends in Philippi either already were or soon would be facing persecution also for their Christian faith by the Roman Empire. So he shared his experience and his faith with them and he encouraged them to prepare themselves by remembering the goodness, the promises, and the faithfulness of God. He wrote to them, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. 
Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In the words that Mandy sang earlier, why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he? His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. In the Lord I'll be ever thankful. In the Lord I will rejoice. Look to God. Do not be afraid. Lift up your voices. The Lord is near. Lift up your voices. The Lord is near. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now let us confess together the faith which we hold using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. All-knowing God, you discern our thoughts and are acquainted with all of our ways. Before a word is on our lips, you know it altogether. You guide us throughout our journeys, forgiving our waywardness, equipping us to serve you, and fulfilling our needs. Nothing we do ex escapes your eye. There is nowhere we can hide from you. You are within and without, before us and beyond us. And yet we try to test your wisdom with our questions, what must we do? How shall we serve? And then we try to earn your love with our works. Silence the anxiety within us, we pray. Tell us yet again of your wondrous works and unfailing love. Remind us yet again, O oh God, in this age of uncertainty and isolation, of people who dare to touch those whom others have judged untouchable, of people who rise above long-held prejudices to kneel at the side of the wounded, of people who sacrifice time and comfort and even pride to save a stranger from pain. O oh God, hasten the day when our love for you matches your mercy towards us. Enlarge our hearts to the dimensions of your mercy and help us to return to you a measure of the love you give to us. You have charged us to love our neighbors, O God of grace. And so give us the mind of Christ as we encounter your children. Let your spirit descend upon us so we may pour it out upon a suffering and fractured world. O God of compassion, empower us, for it is your grace that enables us to love someone besides ourselves, to be patient with the pain of others, to rejoice in the relief of suffering, no matter what the cost. Help us to stop abandoning to others the fate of the world 
while seeking privilege for ourselves, help us to begin acknowledging our responsibility to care before the opportunity to care has passed us by. It is in your name that we lay before your, our prayers for friends and strangers alike, for those who face the end of life and those who celebrate new life, for those who grieve a loved one and those who discover a new love, for those who await test results and those who have completed successful treatments, for those who are hungry and those whose hunger no human can fulfill, for those who serve you this day, bring healing and hope, joy and generosity, peace and participation in your kingdom. For it is in your kingdom we long to see before us, your kingdom we long to serve, your kingdom we long to be part of. So we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his gathered disciples to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Freely has God given to us in Jesus Christ. Let us now return to God but a portion of our blessings, our time, our talent, and our tithes. On your screen, you'll find ways that you can give back to the ministry and mission of this congregation. Let us pray. All good things come from you, O oh God. You have done great things, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. We give you glory. You created all that is, and with love formed us in your image. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. All that we are and all that we have are a trust from you. And so, in gratitude for all your gifts, we offer you ourselves and all that we have in union with Christ's offering for us. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. 
Our closing hymn this morning is number 634, To God Be the Glory. So I charge you to be thankful today, thankful to God. Yes, thankful that it's not always like it is right now in our world, but thankful that it hasn't been that way and thankful that it will not be that way again in the future. Thankful that God's goodness will prevail. God's goodness is always with us, will walk with us through every valley. And now may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from the other. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace both now and in the life everlasting. Amen.